It is six o'clock and I will call the 20th, 22nd regular common council meeting to order. Will the clerk please state the quote of the day? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Don't find fault, find a remedy. All right, will the clerk please call the roll? Alderperson Ackley. Excuse. Alderperson Decker. Here. Alderperson Feldy. Here. Alderperson Felicki Paneski. Here. Alderperson Laster. Here. Alderperson Mitchell. Here. Alderperson Perella. Here. Alderperson Salazar. Here. Alderperson Savaglio. Present. Alderperson Walton. Here. There are nine present. For those in attendance, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, first item is approval of the minutes. Alder Flicky Paneski. I move to approve. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion on the minutes from our previous meeting? Seeing none, all those in favor, please state aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Minutes are approved. Next, the city attorney. Thank you. There is uh, one uh, mayoral appointment. The mayor submits the following appointment for your consideration to the Senior Activity Center Commission. Karen Kober for a term to expire April 15, 2024. And that will lay over. And then a confirmation of a, uh, an appointment by the mayor. The mayor submits the following appointment for your consideration to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Salasani Salasander, for a term to expire April 18, 2022. I move to confirm. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please state aye. Aye. Excuse me, that's a roll call. Aye. Let's go to your muni codes. Nine eyes. All right, that's approved. Thank you. Anyone for public forum? No one this evening. All right, we'll just jump right into a uh, presentation by Director Chad Pelichek and Phil Kossin from Ehlers. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Mayor. So tonight we're gonna tag team a presentation called Tax Incremental Financing 101. Um, we're gonna give a little bit of a background about TIF districts, some definitions, some information, um, and then dive into the current districts and the financials related to that. So the city has retained Ehlers Associates to help us look at the districts and make some recommendations moving forward on their financial stability and, and or closure of those districts. So we'll uh, go through some of that in detail. So to start out with, what is a TIF? Um, a TIF is a mechanism for funding development and infrastructure related to redevelopment and or development. Uh, it allows all taxing jurisdictions benefiting from the development to share in its costs. We interchangeably use the word TIF and TID. So a TIF is the actual financing option that allows a municipality, a town, village, or city to fund infrastructure and other improvements through property tax revenue on a new, newly developed property. 
and a TID is the actual boundary or the district of the uh, area identified by the municipality for the certain type of development. So a little bit about the TID law background. The TIF law was adopted by legislation at the state in 1975 to eliminate blighted areas and urban neighborhoods. Uh, before the TIF law was enacted, a if a municipality wanted to expand its local tax base, a municipality alone would have to pay the cost, but the overlapping taxing jurisdictions would also benefit from the growth the legislator saw this as a situation as unfair and viewed TIF as a way to help remedy the problem and encourage cooperation between local governments. And the city of Sheboygan's case, the other taxing jurisdictions is the is Sheboygan County, the school district, Sheboygan Area School District, and Lakeshore Technical College. So there's a number of TIDs um, or TIPs, TIDs, uh, blight elimination. Um, was an early one uh, and that was replaced sometime later by a rehabilitation district. Uh, this district is technically, is typically open for 27 years. Um, an industrial TID is used to fund industrial and business parks and it's open for 20 years. A mixed use district is mixed use development so it could be residential and or commercial. That is open for 20 years and then an environmental uh, district is used to fund environmental cleanup. So how does TIF work? And we've had a lot of discussions about this, but upon creation, the value of the TID is frozen for the property, for property tax distribution purposes. So basically whatever the value of that property within that district is at the time of certification by the Department of Revenue, that's basically held stagnant. And that's the value that the, in our case, the city would, get and the taxing jurisdictions would get from a value going into the general fund. Any new value created in the district above that then goes into the district and used to pay down expenditures within the district. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of, and then when the district closes, all taxing entities start to realize the benefits of the new value. So the, the purpose of this is really economic development tool and to revitalize, in our case, old areas that are vacant or blighted or underutilized bring some new value in and then when the district closes that goes back on the tax rolls and everybody sees a benefit. So there's a number of ways that TIF projects can be funded. Um, it can be done through bonding of a upfront funding um, where the city would go out and borrow the money and give a basically a grant if you will to the developer. Uh, another one is a city-led pay-as-you-go, so that's the one that we typically use. So that's where the developer has to capital outlay the monies, and then based on the income from future tax generation, they get paid back over time. Um, as well as the developer-led pay-as-you-go, I, I guess those could be kind of interchangeably. Um, basically, that they're, for, they're paying for the improvements in their financing package, and then as they perform over time, we would pay them back. So there's a number of uh, ways that you can amend districts. Uh, four uh, reasons to amend a dif district would be to modify the project plan, to add or subtract property within the TID, to extend the maximum life, or to donate tax increments to other uh, districts. Um, TIF amendments, boundaries may be changed up to four times. There's no limit on the project plan amendments. Um, one expenditure period amendment if it's not cash flowing. And then um, both the TID amendments and project plan, plan, project plan changes need to be approved by the Joint Review Board. So what is the Joint Review Board? In our case, it's a representative from the Sheboygan Area School District, one from the Technical College, one from Sheboygan County, a representative from the city and a public member. Um, and then there's the opportunity for an affordable housing extension. So uh, this was added to TIF in 2009 and it allows a city that has a district that has re retired its debt or other obligations to extend the life of the district for one year. And if the city adopts a resolution extending the district for one year and disclose it how it intends to improve its housing stock, um, you can take these funds and use them for other purposes. So uh, the Department of Revenue grants approval on these extensions. 
um, 75 percent of the tax increments need to benefit affordable housing uh, anywhere within the city not just specific to that district and affordable housing is defined by the uh, law as housing costing no, no more than 30 percent of the household's gross monthly income so this is a listing of the current TIDs within the city of Sheboygan. So TIF 6 is uh, South Pier and the lakefront out to the marina. That's our oldest district. TID 10 is the Water Street area, primarily down here along the river. The Kingsbury Apartments and some of those garden uh, toy apartments were included in that. Uh, TID 12 is A Street office building, so that is the uh, Nemsh, uh, what used to be the Nemshaw for Herman Miller office building where Rody Dales is today and the Grand Stay uh, Hotel. So it's a small district kind of on that corner. Um, the land, TID 13 is Landmark Condo. So this is the landmark uh, building that had burnt in 2007 and was rebuilt that includes that property as well as the Founders Club or the old Sheboygan Senior Community. Uh, TID 14 it was originally created for festival foods development and has since expanded to include the Meyer Foods. Uh, TID 15 is the pick and save property and some residential property on the south side of Sheboygan. TID 16 is downtown A Street. Basically, it's A Street from the river up to the Wild Center and then expands out to include the Wells Fargo property to the east. TID 17 is Indiana Avenue, so it's basically from the lake out to 14th Street and then um, down South 7th Street to just shy of King Park. So the old Optenberg property is kind of the southern limit. TID 18 is the South Point Enterprise Campus, our new business center on the south side. TID 19 is the Riverbend neighborhood. This is primarily around the um, Dulmus Decor um, where the Water Street Hotel is being, Watershed Hotel is being developed, the old um, Gloss Coffee Shop, and then the uh, LT, Lakeshore Technical College campus across the road. So it's a small district kind of on the, uh, kind of bend in the river. And then the last one, TID 20, is the former Vandervart where Oscar uh, Apartments and Quick Trip are being built. So we're gonna dive, into the districts a little bit more detail. So the TIF 6, uh, TID 6, the South Pier, you can see the map on the screen. It is a fairly large district. It was created in 1992. Uh, the expenditure period, so anything after that date of 12-31-2017, we're unable to make any further expenditures in that district. And it's uh, slated to close in 2023. It had been amended a number of times. It has gone through a number of years of changing of TIF law. So that's uh, 33 years is the expansion time. That's not really never seen, um, but there was some challenges with uh, issues related to the South Pier development in Blue Harbor that the legislature took some additional action to extend that district. Um, the estimated close date is uh, this year, it was originally created as a blight elimination district. It has uh, currently is generating around 1.5 million in increments. So that's the new tax value on top of um, basically the revenue that the district is creating. And as I mentioned, this one would be eligible for an affordable housing tax credit in 2022 and close in 2022. Um, so we'll talk about what that looks like and what those numbers look like near the end of the slides. But I would, the next one, I would turn it over to Phil to talk about the financials. Great. Thank you, Chad. Um, good evening, everyone. Phil Costin with Eller. It's nice to be with you. Uh, we, these are all going to look very similar. These are our, our, uh, materials and we're numbers people. So bear with me. Um, what you'll see here is that in the orange heading is where we're showing the anticipated revenues for a tax increment district. Here we have the tax increment, the revenue, that's actually the increase in valuation and the taxes generated on that. There's exempt computer aid in many of these that are, are kind of held constant uh, by the Department of Revenue. 
Here you have a ground lease fee that is revenue that's coming back into this district, uh, some loan receivables, and to a total revenue number. So if you're taking that revenue number minus your obligations, uh, what we're trying to drive down to is, is the district healthy enough at this point to actually close out? Uh, partly why we got involved was to make sure that we're looking at each of the districts uh, with the intent to see if whether or not a district can be closed, if there could be a revenue sharing, should it be amended. We kind of went through all those criteria for each of the districts. Under the expenditures, there are some remaining debt payments, a transfer, and some small administrative costs. And as Chad indicated, in 2022, we would expect to generate enough revenue to be able to close out this district. With the ability to, again, if uh, it, it, you know, it's a policy decision to keep these districts open, uh, but you would be able to collect a million four forty two of revenue in 2023 uh, to, for affordable housing. So we'll touch on each of these in a little bit and get more into the affordable housing discussion later on. So the next district is TID 10, um, the Water Street. It's set up the same way. There's a map kind of showing the boundaries along the Sheboygan River. This was a blight elimination district created in 1997. Um, would close, could close in 2024 or earlier. It generates about $392,400 in uh, TIF increment revenue. Um, it is eligible for the affordable housing extension as well and to close in 2022. So I will let Phil, talk about this one. All right, thank you, Chad. And again, if you look at the same setup as the last one, I'm not gonna walk through each of the numbers here, but again, in the in the orange heading are all the revenues uh, and the expenditures are all in the, in the green. Uh, you do have a development incentive with Van Horn Development Group here uh, that will be fully paid off in 2023. There are some general fund advances that are gonna be reimbursed back to the general fund. Uh, as part of this district. And again, uh, what we're projecting in the balance columns in 2022, you would have the ability again to close this district out with the possibility again of retaining one year's of revenue for affordable housing. The next district is TID 12, the East Street Office Building and Grand State, and then some of the uh, Wild Center, Black Pig, and some of the parking lots. So this district, like the other ones, is a rehabilitation district created in 2000, uh, would close, could close in 2027. This is a donor district to TID 17. So this is uh, sharing revenues from this district to TID 17, which was Indiana Avenue. Um, however, that may not be needed in the future because TID 17 is doing better than um, anticipated. So this district generates around 191,776 in revenues and like the other districts is eligible for the affordable housing. Yeah, again, uh, much smaller district, uh, much smaller revenue amounts here. Uh, one of the things we discovered quickly uh, as we got into TID number 17 was that we really didn't need to share additional revenue with 17 which then freed up uh, the ability for TID number 12 to close out in 2022 as well. As Chad indicated, TID 17 is healthy enough at this point. There's been enough development uh, for it to support itself without revenue coming from another district. So this district will be, looked to be, will be looking to close out in 2022 as well. The next one, TID 13, Landmark Condos. Um, as I said before, it's primarily the Landmark Condos and the Founders Club or the Sheboygan, the old Sheboygan Senior Community, a very small district really generated uh, to uh, facilitate the development of the condo project. So it was created in 2005, uh, expenditure period runs through 27, 2027, and it has an end date of 2032. Um, it is a donor district like TID 12 with TID 17 generates around 442,000 and would be eligible for the affordable housing tax credit. I've been around so long I created this district back in 2005, so 
Um, I'm back. <laughs> so uh, this district again was created back as Chad indicated. Uh, this is a, a, a blight district, meaning it could stay open for a lot longer uh, period of time. Uh, but again, uh, decision at least at the staff level at this point is to close this district out uh, since revenue it doesn't need to be shared with 17 as well. So uh, this will be able to be closed out and again, possibly up to about $400,000 available for affordable housing also. TID 14, the Taylor Heights Festival Foods and Meyer. So you can see the district that this uh, covers primarily the uh, area around Taylor and Erie Avenue and some of the on and off ramps and then the old the Sunny Ridge and some of that redevelopment area to the northeast I guess you could say so this was created in 2011 could close in 2031 it was created as a mixed-use district which would give it a maximum life of 20 years it generates about 1.5 million a year in revenues and uh, like the other ones is eligible for the housing affordable housing extension yes I was involved in this district creation as well um, and um, really this this really was the old Menards uh, building that uh, was then turned into festival foods no, Walmart. Walmart sorry uh, Walmart building it has been a while thank you uh, back back a while so Again, similar to the other districts, uh, we expect this district to be able to pay off all its obligations with the cum cumulative balance uh, that remains. And uh, again, in 2022, be able to close out this district. TID 15, the pick and save. Um, so this was used for the redevelopment of the what used to be the Kmart into the pick and save that unfortunately sits vacant. However, there is a lease that they're they're paying the, the same rate as if they were in the building, so the developer really has no interest in um, going out and finding a tenant, but the tax value has, to our benefit, stayed at the high level as if the building is occupied. So this was created in 2011 as well, um, would, could have a closure of 2031 as a mixed-use district for 20 years. Um, revenue is about 230000 um, and is eligible for the housing extension in 2024 and could close in 2024 because there's some obligations that still need to be met. Again, very similar story here. There are obligations here that run through 2024. There's a cumulative balance that's been built up in that in that TID fund and again enough in 22 already to close out this district. Uh, this is one you could, you could probably keep open for other purposes in that neighborhood but uh, without another prospect, it makes sense to close this out at this time. TID 16, the downtown Sheboygan A Street, as I said, basically runs from the visitor center uh, property all the way up to Wisconsin Avenue. And then that little leg that goes to the east is the uh, Wells Fargo and some property that they own uh, west of North 6th Street, I think that is. Um, so anyway, that district was created in 2015. It was created to provide development incentives to develop the High Point Apartments and the Encore Apartments. Um, it's a 20-year district. It runs through 2035. Um, its annual income is around 587000 um, So there's a little bit more to tell here. Yeah, so if you spend a little bit of time looking at this uh, cash flow and you look at the last columns on the right where it says annual and cumulative, you'll see that uh, for the time being, this district is in the red. Um, not unusual for newer districts to be in the red until development really picks up. Uh, there's projected shortfalls for the next couple of years. Uh, until a lot of the debt and the incentives fall off. We fully expect that will be fully reimbursed back. And in 2032, this district will be in the black and we'll have the ability to close out at that time, which will still be five years earlier than the maximum life. So it, it's just taking a little time to, to work its way through. But uh, from all project, our projections at this point, it will be a healthy district in the future. So this is a real example of how what TIF is set up for. 
is to take on a lot of debt in the beginning and then pay it off over time as the increment comes in. There ha there was some, um, there's been a number of capital projects that have been uh, funded against this district, like the uh, updates to the street lighting to LED conversion along A Street, so that's an ongoing uh, expense that has been built into this as well. So TID 17 is the uh, Indiana district, it was created in 2018, so it's relatively new. It's a 27-year district. Um, it could run through 2042. Um, it sees increment revenue of about 800,000 per year. Um, and the indications are that it will be, it'll do fine. It'll be, ca it'll be positive cash flow moving forward. Um, it was really created to facilitate some of the redevelopment along Indiana Avenue, the former Pentair property, and then the Optenberg property to the south. So you can see that it's a relatively large district. Um, it has seen some successful projects with the Badger State Lofts and the uh, condo development that occurred along the Sheboygan River. And then uh, should the development on the former Kepsel move forward, that will only help it out a lot more. So um, it, it right now is a recipient of TIDs 12 and 13, but uh, going forward, it has plenty of cash flow that it doesn't necessarily need that. Yeah, if you look at the uh, the revenue projections and you look at the projected revenue, uh, you'll see that we do show in the third and fourth, the fourth and fifth columns from the left, the revenues that have come in from 12 and 13. And then the third column from the right is that cumulative balance. So there is a healthy fund balance in this tax increment district in part, I think, through from revenues from to 12, 13, a little bit of bond proceeds, some land sale as well. Um, we expect this district, if you look at the cumulative column, to stay in the black through the life uh, and again close out well early, 11 years earlier than the allowed life of the district at this point, um, be a very successful district for the city. So the next few uh, districts are pretty new and there's some um, opportunities. So there is, you won't see a Ehlers um, comparison on these because we're, um, it, because of the, the age, frankly. So I'm just gonna go through some of the details and then uh, there won't be any additional slides on the performance. But the TID 18 South Point Enterprise Campus created in 2018, the expenditure period uh, through 2035. The end date uh, was 2038, has now been approved by the Department of Revenue to 2040. Um, and that's based on an update of the lack, basically to try to get us through the pandemic because we haven't had a lot of development out there as was originally anticipated. So um, we had worked with Ellers to extend this to 2040 to cover some cash flow issues going forward. Um, and we believe that it will make, it's got about 15 to 18 million or so of outstanding debt, but we believe in the end it'll ultimately make it, uh, it'll cash flow itself. Um, right now it's generating around 900,000 in revenue um, is what we budgeted. Uh, and that's primarily from the uh, FedEx project that's also in this district and some improvements that Torganol's making in our current business center. TID 19, Riverbend Neighborhoods. So this was also created in 2018. It'll close in 2038. It's a mixed use district. You can see where this is. Um, the, this is a fluid situation. We've got a number of developments happening. Um, we may need to extend this to include the former Mayline and the adjacent redevelopment authority property, JP Marine along Commerce Street to facilitate some redevelopment and some street construction upgrades in that area going forward. And then the last one is the TID 20, which is the former Vandervart. This was a 27 year district created in 2020, um, closes in 2047 as a rehabilitation district and could uh, basically has minimal uh, debt against it other than some street lights on Georgia Avenue and potentially some trail improvements. So this could be a future uh, donor district with other rehabilitation districts if needed or close early. This has to pay a, 
a fairly large TIF incentive, almost seven and a half million dollars to the roughly $47 million Oscar apartment deal. You wanna talk about this? Sure. <clears throat> well, here's the good news, folks. It's, it's really um, a situation where the, uh, you have a lot of activity in districts, districts that have been around for quite some time and you're at a point where you have the ability to close out six of the districts uh, this year. Uh, and there's some financial impacts to that. There's, there's really three impacts. Uh, one is that the city, like most other communities in the state of Wisconsin, are, are trying to figure out workforce and affordable housing. This will be one avenue uh, to deal with that. So what we projected, uh, if you close out in 22 of these six districts that you look at where it says anticipated amount for affordable housing, uh, the projection is about $3.9 million that would go into a fund that Chad talked about earlier. That there's some, some, um, some, you have to kind of work through the process of how the funds can be used, but it's really earmarked for affordable housing. So it'll be a really good uh, start to a fund in the city of Sheboygan that will allow the city to be more active and working towards uh, workforce and affordable housing issues. Second, uh, when we look at tax impact of, of anticipated borrowings and, and, and your operating levy, one of the benefits of closing out districts is you get a big bump in valuation where you're spreading uh, the overall operations and debt over a larger tax base. Closing out these districts, about $190 million of value will come back online. Uh, that will help absorb, again, future increases in both operating and debt service uh, and kind of uh, hopefully level out uh, the tax levy uh, as well. And then finally, the third is that I mentioned earlier in tit number 10, there's a general fund reimbursement of above $419,000. I'll go back to the general fund. So. You'll get a bump in valuation, which, which helps when it comes budget time. Uh, that'll really take effect in budget year 2024. You have about $3.9 million that'll go into an affordable housing fund and a little bit of money coming back to the general fund as well. <clears throat> so wrapping this up, so the last couple slides here are just some information that we hear all the time. How many TIDs can a city have? Obviously, if we close six districts, we'll be creating additional opportunity should the need arise. But the state statute requires that the equalized value of taxable property in all districts does not exceed 12%. Um, with the most recent creation of uh, TID 20, um, the city's total equalized value of existing TIDs was around 190 million and we could go up to a maximum of 350 million. So uh, we, prior to that, if we didn't close any districts, would have still plenty of value to do that. Um, but with closing districts, obviously that total number will go down. A um, Couple advantages of TIDs, it can increase property values, spur private development, create a stronger, broader tax base, uh, stimulates the investment outside the district typically, and benefits the underlying taxing districts at the end of the TIF as we just discussed. Um, some disadvantages, if the uh, district doesn't materialize as planned, the city may have to find other sources to fund it, and that's kind of where some of those advances from the general fund have happened over the years. Uh, TIDs may be used in areas where development would have not normally occurred, and uh, it can increase the uh, administrative burden of, burden of managing these local districts. So that's it in a nutshell. If there's any questions, we would be happy to answer them. All right, thanks Chad and Phil for that very informative and engaging conversation. Um, any questions from Alders? Uh, Alder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, for an example, TID 13, right now, if we close it, we get about 200,000 of revenue if we keep it open, if I read the charts correctly, if we keep it open, we get a million dollars in a couple more years. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's 300,000 is the revenue, the increment that's generated. So either that would keep going into building up a fund balance or uh, in this case could be shared with 
the donor district, which was TID 17. I don't know where the 1.5 million would have came from. Okay, I guess more generally, my question is, when I looked at the when I looked at the charts, closing closing them out now gives us a certain dollar amount. If we wait another year, we get a higher increment. Is that accurate? You want to answer that? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Clausen. Pull this up, sir. It was TID 13 that I was looking at. Yeah, uh, so there's a couple of things there. One, um, once you have, the state statute is very clear that once you have. I don't know why this is different, but it's not enhancing the slides. Sorry. Oh, okay. I tried to find it for you. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just answer it generally. Sure. So the statutes are very clear that once you have met all the obligations, that you're required statutorily to close out the district. You can't just keep it open to build a fund balance okay. uh, in a tax increment district. So to keep it open, in the case of TID 13, you would have to undertake additional capital expenditures to keep it open. If there aren't expenditures that be made in TID 13, then statutorily you're required to close out the district. I think the decision by staff has been, at this point there are no future capital expenditures in that area, therefore, we don't need to share the revenue with TID number 17 right. anymore. Let's close out the district. Okay, that answered my question. Thank you. Any other follow-ups, Alder Flicky Paneski? No. Nope. Any additional questions from Alders? All right. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Phil. Thank, Thank you, you, Ehlers, for all your work and uh, keeping the TIFs rolling and in pretty good health. Thank you. All right. Next is uh, Todd's, um, Todd Wolf's, our city administrator, his operations update. All right, good evening. I also want to just thank Phil and uh, the Ehlers team um, just to bring everybody up to speed that the work that they're doing on the TIDs is also part of that five-year strategic fiscal management program that we're working on. So again, this is how we look at things. How do we close things? How do we, how do we plan for the future? So this is great work. So thank you again. So good evening, City Council, Mayor, City Clerk, City Attorney. This review uh, is all to do with the many departments that we have and the hard work and dedication. Next. So when we look at this, uh, at this slide, we talk about our prior state and we talk about the four areas uh, of our, that are our main categories. So when we look at the four roads, we talk about our 200 plus miles. We took a, talk about our infrastructure being our third category. And we talk about the age and the value of these assets and how, how important they are. Many of them are 50 to 60 years old, like our city hall here, which, was a, which is presently, I believe, 103 years old. We talk about our number two, um, our fleet, and that's, we, we've addressed that, at least started to with our enterprise program, which I believe the mayor is very happy with, his vehicle. Our number one and most valuable is our actual, our employees. And that's something that we're, we're starting to address as, as we move forward. Next. So when we talk about prior state um, and how we've led to the following issues, so over, the, over time in my position, we talk about communication, we talk about permissions, we talk about approvals, we talk about documentation, our inefficient processes of the past, and our cultural issues and how we're going to improve those. Next. So part of that is we focus on our, our core values. We talk about our, our service, our teamwork, our accountability, our innovation, our respect, our stewardship and fiscal responsibility. These are our stairs and our core values in assisting us. We lead every day with these steps to improve our daily service. Next. So as we look at our core values and we focus on these, we, they drive the city's mission and, uh, and steer toward the city's vision. How do we get there? These provide us support and strategic plan to focus on areas and goals that the city and the council uh, have determined that are very important to us. 
next. We focus to improve and innovate the services provided by, uh, to our residents, daily review of how can we do better. Next. We ensure tighter fiscal and, and process controls. Many projects to, ass to assist in this are happening throughout our, our, throughout our, our, uh, our days. Next. We focus on creating the gold standard of operations, as you've heard me talk about as I've been in this position. We are on this, and this is a journey that we'll continue to work on. Next. We make the city of Sheboygan the employer of choice for our, for our employees and our team members, not just wages and insurance, but the full process and environment that we work in daily. Next. So when we talk about our strategic plan, which is underway presently, we talk about our mission and how, where we wanna be. Next. Our strategic plan has, continues to focus on our city's vision, where the city of Sheboygan will be a family-oriented and prosperous community with a wide variety of housing, business, cultural, and recreational opportunities in a safe and attractive neighborhoods, which we continue to do with the assistance of our our departments and our city council. Our strategic plan, which we've extended um, through 2022, which is underway, the creation of our 2023 strategic plan currently in process. We're looking at our core values, our mission and vision to make sure that we're on target. Next. So as we do that in a 2021 quarterly, um, third quarter three and four um, update for the council, we continue to streamline our processes, manage, manage cleanup efforts, strengthen financial controls, establish policies and procedures um, that we've noted that are either missing or inadequate um, per our 2020 and 2021 CLA studies. We continue to find discrepancies and address infractions as the council has, has been identified. So, so impressed with our finance team um, and the work they've done I, it's just amazing what we've, we've been able to address as we continue to get, get started. Next. So long-term investment uh, fund review and updated completed in our July 2021. Next. Our continued creation of the city's first five-year fiscal um, strategic plan with Ehlers as Phil kind of started to review the TIDs with us. This helps us to be responsible and strategic moving forward. Again, first time ever done. Next. Our grow to appraisals and reevaluation phases. Uh, phase one is completed last year of the five phases. We're in phase two this year in 2022. This is not an area that we should be hiding from and allowing to fall behind. So as you heard me state last year, uh, this this was actually um, out of compliance since 2018. Next. Actively managing accounts receivables, notably delinquent personal property uh, tax penalty payments in 2021, uh, $4,000. Uh, 2021 actual was 37,700. Just amazing when we see that. Exceeding budgeted revenues by 942%. Again, these are great things happening within the city. What more can we say on this other than great job? Next. Neighborly, we have to talk about neighborly. This was Jessica's project and she did a fantastic job. But neighborly loans program and applications, prior state of in-person only applications, five to seven annually, annually, Again, this is to help our, our, our constituents as a last, last line of support. Since July 2021, online applications, 40 to 50 annually, 714% increase. It is so unbelievable that we are able to help our constituents day in and day out with their needs, 714%. This was a huge undertaking on top of the daily responsibilities, decades of problems cleaned up. As you can see, 
our service is now up 714%. Great job. Next one, employee life insurance re reconciliation and retiree in health insurance audit completed. First comprehensive reviews ever in the city's history. 12 in, in, uh, ineligible, excuse me, participants removed from the plan. Just years of negligence that we finally got cleaned up. Next. This one's an easy one if, if, you, get my, if you get my line. Uh, AT&T phone lines consolidation audit completed. 36 unused lines uh, can canceled, uh, creating $9,000 in annual savings. Something so simple but overlooked. Again, asking why do we need what we have, right? Next. So continued improvements in 2021 in our quarters three and four. So we talk about our um, Munis chart of accounts con uh, conversion. Next. Parking stall and rentals and billing uh, moved to Munis, again, off of AS400, one of those old programs that we're trying to work off of. The inaugural Citizens Fire Academy, I have to put a, a plug in there for our, our fire department. Uh, first one, and they did a great job. They actually, um, quite a few of our uh, City Hall staff, myself included, um, Alder uh, Lester was in there also. We realized how hard it is to be a fireman um, or, you know, on, a, on, on call. It's, a, it's just amazing. Uh, next, MyCivic, Electronic Community Information and Engagement Platform, nearing completion. This is to assist our, our citizen communications and technology our program to take us into the future. Next. Our IBMI AS400 migration, 40% of the data reduction. Again, we've continued to really make some huge strides in this. 40% is a huge, huge opportunity because this um, homemade program has been used for so many decades that it, it just takes time to get this information off. So as uh, Eric knows, my, my goal for his department is, in 2022 is another 40%. Yeah, I know he's cringing back there. So next. So as we look at our policy creation updates, long-term investments, our fund balance, our TIF, as you, as you heard about it, our code of ethics, continued growth and development on this is continuing. Next. Enterprise fleet management, a million savings in geo debt for five-year program. Again, this is a huge opportunity for us in taking care of our, our smaller fleet um, part, parcels. So this is a great program. So, uh, it's a slow rollout, be, mainly due to uh, supply chain, but we have been getting vehicles out to our, our departments, DPW, um, and just getting the old equipment off and the new equipment on, so it looks really great. Next. EAM software implementation was finally approved uh, recently, as we know. So we just, just had our kickoff, um, and um, it's going to take two years, but you're going to hear us talking about it on a regular basis, and it's going to be great. It's very exciting. It's going to allow the council and our teams to really be strategic and understand the lifespan and need for prioritizing throughout the city, not just roads and sidewalks, but facilities and, and so forth. So it's great. Next. So we talk about 2017 to 2021 strategic plan extended through 2022 creation of the 2023 to 2027 strategic plan. Obviously that's, that's in process and moving forward and it's, it's showing some great information. Group sessions were completed. Surveys are still going great. We're about two and a half times what we had back in 2017 as far as constituent input. That's huge, two and a half times the amount of feedback. Now it's a, it's a start, hopefully it'll continue to keep rolling. Next. Ambulance rates, uh, first update in 13 years. Again, these are things that we just don't tend to look at or haven't looked at. And again, they're all mandated, so it's bumping things up to where they should be. 
So the new rates and new col uh, collections uh, group is working with us. So that'll help us with our, um, the revenues in that area. Next. Munis code enforcement and permitting initiation. Better processes and better controls so that we can help our constituents to make sure that we have the community and neighborhoods that we want. Next. Investments in employees, 2021, uh, quarters three and four. We'll talk about that a little bit. So Carlson Detman review, as I'm sure all of the council members and, and department heads are very concerned, where are we with that, Todd? So we're finishing this up very detailed and in depth, and we're continuing to have to really do the deeper dive because we're not looking at just other municipalities, but we're also looking at our neighbors on different jobs that are actually uh, comparable to what we what we do within our city. But a lot of our jobs are actually very refined and very detailed, and it's not like you can just go and take somebody from Sargento or take somebody from uh, Kohler. It's, it's actually you have to take somebody from another municipality, so it's very difficult. We also have to realize that the city is a city, so that means that you can't just go to a village or to a township and say that they have the same positions. You literally have to look at somebody that's gonna to have to relocate to, to fill some of these positions. We also realize that a lot of our positions are actually exactly on scale of where they should be, so that's a great opportunity for us to help us understand where we are. Next. Biometric screen, um, health screening uh, reinstated. It was paused back in 2019. We care to help our team um, help themselves. Biometrics helps us understand possible opportunities for each of us to understand when we take this. Next. Initiated mandatory employment practices, liability training sessions for all staff. Again, training helps us help ourselves and others as we continue to be the employer of choice. Next. Increased training and professional development in 2022 budget, we increased it by $40,000. Again, we were kind of stepped back a little bit back in 2020 because of COVID, but we really need to make sure that we give our employees and our team members the time and the, the ability to get the training that they need to help take us to that next, that next level. So training helps helps us help each other raise the bar as we move forward. Next. Wellness Committee uh, revamped, rebranded, renamed, however we wanna look at that. We, we're now the Wellbeing Committee and we also continue to use our Go365 for those that are on our insurance program. Again, it's helping our employees to understand how they're, how they're doing and help themselves to be healthier. So reviewing how we can excite and involve as many team members to help us in being well be with our well-being. Next. All right, HSA contribution for 2022 that was included in uh, this year's budget. And it, again, it's not guaranteed, but uh, you know, if it works, if we can work and, and stay, stay healthy, um, that keeps the rates down, this is something that we should be providing our employees as an incentive. Next. So investment in employees, 2021. Again, initiated the internal journeys to, uh, to, to supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging within our workplace culture, providing clarity and understanding relating, related to appreciating our valued experiences, our varied experiences, backgrounds, and cultures. Had our first all staff training session, creating and sustaining authentic relationships in the workplace. Again, we're starting our journey of educating and learning to become an employer of choice and belonging. Next. Looking forward into 2022, every time we tear a leaf off the calendar, you present a new place for new ideas and progress by Charles Ketting. Next, perfect, all right. So our strategic plan, we're in the define, uh, we, we completed the, the define portion of it. Uh, we did that in the beginning of uh, 2022. Baker Tilly is a collaborative member and it's the city's first time professionally done. Next. We're in process of the Discover uh, P2 
piece, and that's engaging our internal and external stakeholders. We had nine external focus groups, um, many of which were quite, quite commutative, where they gave us a lot of information, some a little bit more difficult than others. Then we'll be creating our SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Next. From there, we'll develop um, and review our mission and vision and core values, making sure that they're in, um, representative of what, we, what information we've, we pull together from our constituents and uh, from our, our department heads. So we'll review that, identify and prioritize strategic goals, create a strategy map, prepare de uh, deployment uh, um, to move out. Next. The deploy. Uh, that's basically where we develop and change management program, assign accountabilities, completion milestones, and we'll work with our department heads to make sure that we can develop key performance uh, indicators and targets. We'll, be, we'll make sure that we can measure it, monitor it, and report it, and make sure that we make adjustments accordingly, or as I call it, course corrections as we go. Next. Looking forward to 2022. I'm sure you're all excited about what's coming. So the new year, new strategies. Continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection by Mark Twain. So as we look at our in, um, investments in employees in 2022, we're continuing our internal journey, supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. Again, we're building our, pl our plan and program, and we'll talk about that um, when we have our HR presentation in the future. Learning skills to support critical conversations and civility, creating synergies and sharing resources with community partners. Again, we're working with our community to help us become better together. Moving forward, Munis uh, Human Capital Management Module expansion, majority, the majority of it has been unused, untouched, untapped for 15 years. It's just unbelievable when you think about the modules that we have that we haven't used. Next. We talk about Munis Project Ledger and Capital Assets Module implementation owned for 15 years and not used. Again, Caitlin um, basically is working on this as many with, again, with many other projects and her team. This is going to allow us to have compliance with state and federal reporting. Again, instead of having to pull things from different areas, um, we're actually going to be able to upload it in one report, complete and accurate. Next. Munis General Ledger Fund, consolidation redesign. Again, this was Caitlin's uh, huge project that she has with her team going on as we speak. Um, so this is going to be it's going to go from 1,081 a, a cost centers down to 60. Just think about that. If you had to go through 181, now we're only going to have 60 categories. Then you look at 6,143 accounts reduced to 557. Again, it's just unbelievable how complicated we were and how disjointed we are and how clean it's going to be and how easy. It's a huge redesign. It's still in process. Uh, the team members are reviewing to make sure that all of the consolidation is working. It's being worked on in our training environment, and it's going to be rolled out very soon. Next. Munis upgrade uh, to version uh, 21, uh, 2021, technically point three now. I heard about that this morning. Uh, second upgrade in one year, keeping ERP uh, system and technology up to date. This is tremendous information because it affects everybody. And just the understanding that we are now updating things on a regular basis is just huge. And when you think about it, how often does it happen at home or on your phone? Now we're actually doing it here at the city. And it's going to continue to happen and get better. So again, starting to plan our regularly scheduled updates for our teams. Next. Munis payroll module and process enhancement proper use of workflows and approvals. Again, this is also, this is also more connected to the HR uh, side of it and to our employees. Again, this is how we, we need to start using our, our modules that we have out there. Next. 
Exploration of uh, Tyler Munis payments, cashiering, electronic payments. Again, this is another module area that is just, it's huge, it affects so many departments, and, it, and it's a positive um, and productive process that we're gonna be focusing on this year. Next. Munis business license module. We're in the process of doing a gap analysis. And again, these are areas that we need to continue to focus on to improve our, our opportunities. Next one is Executime, um, integrated electronic time management systems exploration. This one actually excites me tremendously just because it's, it's going to touch all of our hourly employees and help them to be able to do what they do more efficiently and effectively. There's just so many disconnects at that level. Next. So as we look at this in 2022 moving forward, there's a few items that we'll touch on real quickly and that citywide reevaluation continues a little behind um, our, our aggressive 2021 goal, but we just were getting started. And in 2022, I've been informed that we're gonna be able to catch up and get back on schedule. Next, our financial, financial control and enha enhancements. Again, these are areas we have hired Baker Tilly, um, which is a, a great company. They're not only one part of them is doing our strategic planning, but a second part portion of them, a separate piece, is actually going to be doing our um, actual um, auditing processes in our finance department. So continuous growth and improvement, we will potentially find issues. I'm anticipating it. I know Caitlin and I are dreading it, but we know that with finding problems, it provides us to open the door to finding solutions and getting better, right? Next. DTS ViewWorks EAM Systems. Again, exciting program. It's a long project. It's gonna take you know years one and two for implementation. We're excited uh, to have this uh, for, strategic, for strategic planning. Many of our facilities are 50 plus and have problems. And you'll hear us talk about that when we reference the TID closures and opportunities. Again, it's, it's really to understand how can we understand and finance strategic problems that we need to address that have been not taken care of for decades. Next. Enterprise fleet management vehicles um, arriving, as we t I touched on before. This is a great project for our smaller vehicle fleets. At some point, we'll be looking at other areas for improvement in our, within our fleets on the larger vehicles. Next. Our significant infrastructure investment, in, um, investments that we've had uh, thus far, we've had fire, rescue, pumper truck, uh, the, a new ambulance to expand service, South Lakeshore interceptor sewer project that's coming through, our municipal wastewater treatment plant upgrades, Again, these are all great things that are happening in 2022. Next. This one is very exciting for myself and for many of our constituents and, and department heads. Um, this is the delivery of the 10 new fixed route transit buses. We're actually sending um, our lead mechanic from transit actually to the facility where they're building them. And he's going to actually be there to make sure to watch, monitor, and make sure that the, the construction and assembly of the new um, buses will be done to the standard that we need. This is gonna be the first time where the city of Sheboygan's had 100% um, the highest level of new vehicles going out for our constituents. It's gonna help us really to plan into the future. The next time we look at buying buses in the future, we'll be looking at the size of them and what kind of fuel? Do we want diesel? Do we want you know regular? What about battery or natural gas? Things like this, or I should say natural compressed gas, but the point is the next level of improvement for the buses is really gonna be more of how are the efficiencies of those buses into the future. Next. Housing advancement strategies. Again, this is a huge, huge area for the council and for the mayor and myself. You know, uh, creative, creative advancements in housing uh, study, the senior housing options and opportunities that we're looking to bring to, to the city. Single family housing development, as we all know, we're working diligently on that. 
and multifamily veterans housing, which is coming through, as we know. Again, the success of great business businesses is relying on this. We need to we need more housing so that we can have more great uh, constituents move and enjoy the the gem of Sheboygan. Next. Business advancement strategies. Again, continued attention and adjustments as we work with our, our plan, our ARPA plan, but also with the grants that come in, making sure that we're, we're flexible enough to, to expand on all of that opportunity. Next. 2022 lean principles. As you, as you all know, I'm very, very huge on the, on the fact of continuous improvement. And we had quite a few more team members. We had nine more team members uh, join us in this uh, great opportunity. And if we do the same things and we expect different um, outcomes, this is the definition of insanity, right? So what we really want to do is look at everything we do daily. How are we doing it? Why are we doing it? There's so many things that we've, con we've done in the past because we've always done it. Does it add value? Does it, does it have an R ROI on it? So we're doing a great job on that and I look forward to seeing us continue that. Next. This is actually taken from one of our, from our fire station three, our headquarters, and it's the big four. And I wanna give kudos uh, to that department because this is actually hanging on the wall. This is kind of their mantra or one of them. And that's do your job treat people right, all, all in attitude, all out effort. Words of inspiring and motivation provided by, fire, by Sheboygan Fire Department Station 3. This is hanging on the wall. This is what they think every day when they're walking around doing their job. That's what we do as a city. Next. So this one here is kind of, the iceberg is a little bit like Sheboygan, right? You see what's on top, but you don't realize what's on the bottom, and that's continuous improvement and development. So improvement initiative continued. I, des I described the design process as, I, as like the tip of an iceberg. What you don't see is in the long haul, and that's by Norman Foster. Again, many thanks and praises to the departments and team members. They are our future success as we continue to move forward with the council's assistance. So thank you. Thank you, Administrator Wolf. Um, any questions from Alders? Uh, Alder flicky -Pineski? I actually have a request, if you would, um, forward your PowerPoint to all of the Alders, and likewise um, for Mr. Palachek, if you would forward yours too, please. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? All right, sounds good. Well, thank you, Administrator Wolf, for, for that presentation. I hope the, 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 the council really sees all the hard work that, um, that is getting done, especially Administrator Wolf leading and fixing and modernizing the city's internal operations. Um, there's a lot of work going on internally and externally in this community, so let's keep it up. Let's keep moving our city forward, and thank you for the council for all your support on that. Moving right along, item number 10, Alder Person Flicky Pineski for the consent agenda. This is items 11 through 23. I move to receive and file all reports of officers, receive all reports of committees, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on anything on the consent agenda? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your Mooney code. The consent agenda is approved. Next, we'll jump down to item number 24, reports of officers. RO number 
126-21-22 by the Director of Planning and Development submitting a communication providing additional information relating to the purchase of Chuckums Hall at 2601 North 15th Street by the City of Sheboygan. Alder Flicky Paneski. I move to receive and file the document. Second. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a voice vote. To all those in favor of receiving and file the document, please state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Aye. That item is approved. All right, next is item 25, RO number 129-2122 by the City Plan Commission, to whom was referred General Ordinance number 38-2122 by Alderperson Savalio, annexing territory from the town of Sheboygan to the city of Sheboygan wishes to report that the standard was discussed at a regular city plan commission meeting on February 15th. Alder Person Savalio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I make uh, a motion to receive the RO and adapt the ordinance. Motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code. Nine eyes. All right, that item is approved. Items 26 and 27 will be referred to the variety of committees. Number 28, resolutions. Resolution number 432122 by older persons Feldy and Flicky Pineski, authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a listing contract with NEI to <coughs> provide real estate services to the city of Sheboygan industrial property within the South Point Enterprise Campus and the Sheboygan Business Center. Older person Flicky Paneski. I move to suspend the rules. Any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed with your motion. I move to adopt the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Open for discussion. Any discussion on this item? Director Pelichek. Thank you, Mayor. So this is a document. The reason that it's a suspension of the rules is there's an opportunity for some industrial development that uh, is occurring in a different community that might we might have a chance of getting here through NAI Fefferly. So the idea here is to get under an agreement with them that if they are in, indeed able to um, encourage the development to occur in one of the two city of Sheboygan business parks, we would be willing to pay um, some commission towards them to do so. Uh, this is a three-year open-ended agreement. This isn't an exclusive, so other brokers can still come in and market the property, um, but they have a client that they're working with that might be able to, uh, that has some interest in developing a fairly large industrial building, and we would like to have a chance at it at, in our parks. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your board doc, or your muni code. Nine eyes. All right, that's approved. Item 29, resolution number 141 21 22 by all the persons Feldy and Flicky Paneski, ratifying retaining outside legal counsel on behalf of the municipal court judge related to matter before the Wisconsin Ju Judicial Commission. Uh, Alder Flicky Paneski? I move to suspend the rules. Any objection to suspension? Seeing none. I move to adopt the resolution. Motion and second. Any discussion? Push the buttons. Alder Decker. Uh, I guess I'm kind of questioning what is the whole, what this is about. Uh, why city we're attorney. spending money on this and why we're, what this, what's going on here? Yeah, so it's a matter before the Wisconsin Judicial Commission. It is a uh, um, confidential matter at this point, so I can't really get into much of it. Um, but it is uh, related to matters that take place in the course of the judge's duties. Uh, and as such, we are uh, required to provide outside legal counsel. In this particular case, 
Normally we hire outside counsel for these things for employees in the course of their duties uh, locally, in part because we can get good rates, uh, but uh, we were able to negotiate uh, the equivalent rate to what we get from our local firms uh, with the firm out of Madison that specializes in matters before the Judicial Commission. So uh, we're not spending any more money than we would otherwise. Follow up? I guess, uh, well, just, just, I, I just, I, I am kind of concerned about uh, the, the municipal court having issues again as we have had in the past. Thank you. Alder Perella? Yeah, actually, I had the same question, so uh, it was partially answered. Um, I'm not sure how we make a decision without knowing the details of the case. I mean, personally, I also have concerns about that. Um, and also, do we have a choice? I mean, we do not know the details of the case. We have to decide anyway if going with the, with the uh, third party external counsel, what's the choice that we have tonight? You really don't have much choice. Um, we, we, are, we are required to um, basically protect our employees when, when they do work in the course of their duties. Uh, we did specifically include in this contract that if it turns out there are things outside the course of the duties, that that's not our responsibility, but I don't anticipate that's going to be an issue here. Um, it, it, the only other option you would have is if you turned it down, then the judge basically would be able to go wherever she wanted to get the work done and then just basically turn the bill over to us, and then, then we would have to pay it. We figured it would be better to, to negotiate that in advance, and that's what we've done. Follow up, Alder Perlin? Um, at which point this council will uh, know the details of the case? I don't know that you ever will. Um, it really depends on how it turns out. Uh, so it is not all that, I, I don't know. It, 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 when, when the Judicial Commission sort of handles if somebody makes a complaint and then determines whether there was even anything to complain about, um, and if they make the determination that there's nothing to complain about, then, you know, then it will uh, go away and you probably won't hear anything more uh, about it. If it's determined that there was some other problem, well then, you know, I imagine that depending on the nature of the problem, it may come back to us at some, at some later date. Additional follow-up? Just uh, one very quick one. Um, so I, did I understand correctly that the, um, so the city has an obligation to provide legal counsel. So regardless if it is internal or external, we have an obligation, even if we did, even if we had, even if we wanted to challenge it, but we have an obligation as a city to provide legal counsel to our employees, to the city's employees. Yes, okay. we, we have that obligation for actions that are taken in the course of their duties. And we, we do this fairly regularly. I mean, as an example, if, if the police ticket a uh, plow driver, uh, we, we provide them a lawyer too, and we've done that many times in the past. Yes, it's just the, the, the degree of it in this case and also the, uh, the fact that we don't know the details that threw me off a little bit. Thank you. Additional comments, questions? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Nine eyes. That is approved. Items 30 and 31 will be referred to the Finance and Personnel Commission. Next is reports of committees. Item 32, RC number 206, 21, 22 by the Licensing Hearing of the Public Safety Committee to whom was referred RO number <coughs> 117, 21, 22 by the Chief of Police, Christopher Domagowski, pursuant to section 5465 of the Municipal Code. 
Submitting the quarterly report and the benchmark measurements for the Sheboygan Police Department for the period commencing October 1st, 2021 and ending December 31st, 2021. Alder Decker. I make a motion to file the report. As, as amended. As amended. I'm sorry. File the report as amended. Thank you. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Alder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, Officer Domagowski, Chief. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I, I, have, I have in front of me a September 30th report and um, a report that was dated January 17th that was year-end December 31, 21. And when I went down the goals column, this came to council, last council meeting. When I went down the goals column, the 2021 goals, there were four of them that had been changed. The numbers were different between the September 30th goals of 21 and the December 30th goals. So when, when we look at goals for 2021, are they indeed full year goals? Sure. You can look at um, the 2020 annual report where the goals are set for 2021, and that's where you'll find those goals. When the analyst created this report, the 2021 goals for theft, arson, and Facebook likes didn't carry over. Um, I misunderstood what you were talking about when you approached me about it. Um, so the report has been amended to correct that and the amended report is in front of you. Okay, so there were typo, there were typographical errors. There were typographical errors. There was three errors, yep, yeah, that it didn't carry over in. Okay, I counted four, so go back and check the numbers again. But yeah, I'm, I'm happy if you caught the, if you caught them. Thank you, Alder Flickipneski, Alder Perella. One question about the parking tickets issued. Um, why do we have a goal of 10,000 parking uh, issued tickets? Sure, I don't wanna call them arbitrary numbers, but they're numbers that are generated based on past performance over the years to where we think that they're going to be. So in the past, we've written as many as 10,000 parking tickets. Those are down for over the last couple years, um, partly because of COVID, where the parking um, ordinances for winter parking were changed um, and suspended, and then partly just because of available personnel to issue those tickets. Just scares me a little bit. So, I mean, I have to be more careful when I go around because you are 3,000, 4,000 tickets short this year, so. <laughs> So I think a lot of the citizens would be very happy with that. Um, but really it comes down to um, <laughs> what's going on throughout the city and how many people are, are available. So if you want more parking tickets written, we can do that, but you need to provide us with more resources to do that. Thank you, Chief Tamagoski. I have one more short question. Yeah, please proceed. Um, how do you address the, the low percentages of offenses cleared? So it, it seems that the, you have a goal of 70, 73%, 70 73% of offenses cleared, but we cleared 47%. And I'm, I'm just uh, asking, how do you work on that then? Once you have these results, how do you address that specific part? Sure, I would say that I'm very aggressive and set high goals because we have high expectations. I think that you, if you look at the national average, we're above the national average in clearance rates. And so the national average uh, for thefts is about 10%. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, and actually, you just started to touch on it, Chief. Um, when, when, when you set a goal, do you look at the actual, 
you know, three years back, five years back, six years back, and then determine a goal moving forward based on the three-year or the five-year average for us? I do, and the trend, and, and I try to do something, you know, not a goal that we can't reach, some some goal that we can accomplish. And, and I think if you don't understand that, um, you wouldn't understand the progress that we've made uh, and the way that progress is made. Um, and so most of the time that progress isn't going to, if you're successful, things aren't going to go straight down in a line. Yeah. It, it's going to happen over time. And so we're going to make some progress in an area, and we only have so much control over, over crime. There's all kinds of other factors that, that go into it. And so <laughs> I, I can make a, a pie in the sky um, goal of where I'd really like to be, but I, I don't have the ability to control some of those things. And a lot of things, if you look over the history of, of our reduction in, in crime, in robberies or in thefts or in burglaries or any of those where we've been really successful, it's going to dip down and then it's going to it's going to bump up a little bit here and there. And so it's over time that it keeps creeping down. Um, it's in my annual report, some of it, but if you look at some of these numbers, um, it's really remarkable the progress that we made. Um, Again, I don't have those numbers with me, so I'm not going to nail perfect numbers, but I can tell you that in 2009 and 2010, we had about 27 or 30 robberies. And if you look at how many we had this past year, five, it really says something. If you look at our uh, property crime numbers, um, in like 2007, we had about 427 burglaries. Um, and then 2009 and 2010 were about in the 300s. Um, so last year we had 82 burglaries. So from 427 to 82. And, and that didn't happen overnight and it didn't happen just a straight line drop. It's a little bit at a time and, and being aware that sometimes some of the things that do make a difference in those areas um, don't, don't happen perfectly. And so we have to work at them more um, so thefts, thefts about 1,700 thefts in 2010 um, and over 2,000 prior to that, I think like 2,400 in 2007. Um, last year, 563. So um, you go, so you go back 10 years to look at your high average? Um, I've been keeping track of high average since I got here. So, Perfect. so in 2010, I looked at 10 years prior to that, okay. and I remember all of that. Um, and I can't tell you how um, impressed I am not only with the work that our officers have done, but but how a lot of the community has stepped up because the community is the ones that have to do many of the things that really lead to success. And so, something as simple as knocking down thefts means getting people to lock up their property and put it away, take things out of their car, lock their cars, put up lighting around their house, th those simple things. And if they're not willing to do those things, we're not going to reduce these numbers because the opportunity is still going to be there. And unfortunately, that opportunity is too tempting for some people. Yeah, thank you. And I have also seen your neighborhood policing at work, and I see your neighborhood police at the neighborhood associations. And they do a very fine job of relating to their constituents. So thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, Alder Flicky Pineski. Additional comments, questions from Alders? All right, seeing none, this one is a voice vote. All those in favor of accepting the report as amended, please state aye. Aye. Anyone, aye. Opposed? Aye. Anyone opposed that aye. is approved. Next is item 33. RC number um, 217 22 by the Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred resolution number 131 21 22 by older persons Mitchell and Flicky Pineski providing for the sale of approximately $2,215,000 general obligation promissory notes series 2022A. Alder Mitchell. Thank you, Mary. I move to receive the RC and adapt the resolution. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your muni code.
Nine eyes. It is approved. 34, RC number 216, 21, 22 by the Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred resolution number 134, 21, 22 by Elder Burstens Mitchell and Flick Neski authorizing a budget transfer and appropriation in the 2022 budget to complete the interfund transfer between the tax incremental district six debt fund and the redevelopment authority. Elder Mitchell. I move to receive the IRC and adapt the resolution. There's been a motion second. Discussion? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your reading code. Nine eyes. That is approved. 35, RC number 218, 21, 22 by the Finance and Personnel Committee to whom was referred resolution number 137, 21, 22 by older persons Mitchell and Flicky Paneski authorizing the purchase of 5509 Menning Road and vacant lands located east of Menning Road for future use by the city. Recommends adopting the resolution with the amendment to include parcel 59030-454922 to the listing document. Alder Mitchell? I move to receive the IRC and adopt the amended resolution. Second. There's been a motion and second. Discussion on this item? Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Is that Alder Savalio? It sure is. Go for it. Thank you. Um, I think this question will be best answered by our city attorney. Uh, in the offer to purchase, it says the closing date is TBD. And I've always been taught by um, other people in the the space of, of real estate and law that it's not a valid contract if it doesn't have a a uh, date for for it to close. Um, can you please help me understand that better? It's a valid contract. Um, had we been uh, in the one to draft it and, and we weren't, uh, we wouldn't have drafted it that way. Uh, but since it was presented it to presented that way to us, we're, we're good with it. It's not invalid, it's just perhaps substandard might be the way to put it. Thank you. A quick follow-up, when are we closing? As soon as possible. <laughs> Director Pelichek, additional commentary? That what Attorney Adams said is actually is correct. We um, the t TBD in there is because we didn't know if it was going to pass the council in one uh, council meeting, so that was not determined. But the goal is to get the documents together, um, get everything order in order, and try to close in the next week or so. Additional comments, questions. All right, seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Please refer to your reading code. Nine eyes. That is approved. 36, RC number 214, 21, 22 by the Finance Personnel Committee to whom was referred a direct referral resolution number 139 21 22 by older persons Mitchell and Flicky Paneski, authorizing the city administrator to ed execute a master service agreement and statement of work and language line services for on demand language translation services. Alder Mitchell. Thank you, Mayor. I move to receive the IRC and adopt the resolution. Second. There's been a motion. Second. Any discussion on this item? Alder Laster. I'm just curious. Well, I use this already. So is there going to be mass training for people? Will there be mass training for people to know how to use this? And have we thought about I speak cards so people know we have the this tool? Mm, Director Pelichek. Yes, there will be training once it passes. The company is on board to help educate the departments that have customer service windows to start with and then to uh, incorporate the larger staff. Um, so whatever tools are available, they are on board to help us uh, implement it. The munic municipal court uses this, soft, this service already. Um, we, we get a number of requests here. 
Um, most of them are Spanish and Hmong related, and we have identified staff within the city proper that can help provide those services. So if it's a language outside of that area, we would then tap into this, but we will use the internal resources first. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, this is a roll call vote. Elder Savaglio? Did it come through now? Yeah. Yes, it did. Thank you. Nine eyes. All right. That is approved. Mm -hmm. Item 37 will be referred to the Plan Commission. 38 will be referred to the Licensing, Hearing, and Public Safety Committee. 39 will be referred to the Finance and Personnel Committee. Um, Chuck, City Attorney, would you please read item 40? Yes, it's an RO by the city clerk submitting a license application for the period ending June 30, 2022. And that will be referred to the Licensing, Hearing, and Public Safety Committee meeting. All right, we've exhausted the agenda. Older person Flicky Pineski. I move to adjourn. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor of adjourning, please state aye. 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 Any opposition? Aye. We're adjourned at 735. <laughs>